Adventures in Mortuary Archaeology and Commemoration. It's Archeo Death. Hello, Archeo Deathlings, and also simultaneously, hello, University of Glasgow students, because this video is a special commission for Dr. Kenny Brophy for University of Glasgow students and uh, to give them an insight into archaeological blogging. Um, also, simultaneously, of course, it's for everyone uh, to hear the same information and to reflect on it. Now, in this uh, video, I want to basically take you through some of the reasons why I started and continue an archaeological blog. Now, in doing so, the usual proviso, this is my take on it, and others may have different perspectives on blogging, its merits and its limitations. But I want to say that I've found since 2013, since June 2013, doing a WordPress blog, um, Archaeodeath, um, at uh, howardwilliams.wordpress.com, um, to be a fruitful and important medium um, for my academic research scholarship and to a lesser extent, but also an aspect of my teaching. Um, while I haven't made it about any one thing, I haven't reduced it to any single function. And some of it is really none of those things. It's just a bit of fun. Um, my blogging presence and um, identity online has been an integral part of my academic persona, my academic archaeological research. Now, in that time, this is a personal thing, I've been unable to do sort of extensive archaeological excavation and survey work. I have been mainly doing field visits and desk-based and library-based archaeological research, editing, publications. Um, but it, it, I have, just before I started the blog in 2010 to 2012, been doing field work and um, I, that would that is one area therefore I cannot really talk about directly but in all other regards of my academic job teaching research scholarship um, blogging has been sort of set, seeped into and been a, a part of so I'm going to do this in three sections I'm going to talk about what is Archeodeath why I do Archeodeath and then some recommendations some top tips some do's and some don'ts for what I would suggest for anyone starting archaeological blogging. Um, start off with what is Archaeodeath? Since 2013, I've done 1,500 or just short of 1,500 blog posts on Archaeodeath. That's about 200 per year. That's about up to 25 or 30 a month, but usually about 15 a month. I've consolidated it down quite quite uh, restricted terms to 15 per month. Now, that means I'm blogging a lot more than most people do, and that shouldn't be what you necessarily think of doing yourself. But I find uh, once every couple of days writing something on my blog is, is, is a useful practice. I find it useful on a number of different regards and I use it in a variety of different ways. First I use it as a static website. So here's my Archeodeath blog and you can see there's an about section at the top which gives you an introduction to me um, which in itself has a validity given how unreliable university web pages are. They're constantly changing their structure and form. I have full control here over how I present myself and as a, whether I was an independent researcher or a university based researcher, I feel I, I, that is a benefit of having this WordPress play page in and of itself. Just having that static about me, which I can change and, and shift. And on this static material on the blog, I have a review of my research and what I do. And my own bibliography, unbridled and unedited by university administrators and restrictions. So you can look at all of my books um, and links to where they're published and available or not. Um, or I've actually uploaded them. My The special issues of journals that I've done. And in addition to all that, um, I've got actually links to all my journal articles how many have i done 40 journal articles over the last 23 years 24 years right so they're all listed there so a comprehensive howard williams and book chapters as well and there they all are so for any student scholar 
research uh, member of the public wishing to look at my um, book reviews as well, w wishing to find out about me and my work, you have here a static website material. And that, I think, is an important aspect in itself. But of course, um, in general terms, the point of the blog is to write blog posts. And here they are. Every couple of days, you, you have a new one. And on it, I have blog posts that try to do things I wouldn't do in an academic publication. Interim statements, experiments of ideas. Um, many of these are related to field visits to archaeological sites and monuments and museums. Uh, either discussing what's in those spaces, what's to see, but also perhaps critiquing how they're presented. I also talk about my publications and conferences. So they're like news updates on my activities, my publications, my edited books, my my uh, journal articles and so on. The ones I've showed you, I announce launch uh, them via my blog. So I'm not reliant 100 percent on university press releases and so on. And also conferences, the presentations I've given at conferences, the conferences I've attended, um, I, I, I try to do a blog post about them. I also do some debate pieces about controversial issues linked to mortuary archaeology and archaeology of memory. Uh, in terms of the debates, I tend to only look at debates I've addressed in my own research. I don't try to pass comment on everything that, um, in, that's happening in the world of politics, culture, society and archaeology. Although occasionally I do dip into um, broader debates, I tend to focus on the things that I can talk about. Um, and then also there's a broader discussions on the blog about archaeology and popular culture in the media. Um, in TV shows, in film and fiction, and particularly focus again on mortuary archaeology and archaeology of remembrance. So the easiest way to introduce you to how that mix manifests itself is to show you um, the blog itself. So here's my recent one. My latest one is about the end of death itself, spiritual dialogues with the dead in Fear the Walking Dead season two. So this is the American AMC TV show Fear the Walking Dead, the spin-off from The Walking Dead. Uh, and I look at how mortuary archaeology is portrayed in a fictional post-apocalyptic societal collapse. Here's another blog post. This one's about the TV show Vikings and how the funerals in season six, part one, rep represent a mixture of archaeological evidence and guesswork and made up stuff. Um, I've also I've done a lot of posts on TV shows of late, but there's, here's one. This is a publication launch in my journal, the Offers Dyke Journal. So alerting readers to the nature of what's within. Um, um, I'll talk about some other things. There's another publication launch. There are lots of stuff on popular culture and the TV show, The Walking Dead, the, the archaeology in the far show, Suit You, Sir, oh, and um, all manner of other things. I did a podcast. So I did a podcast and I do a blog reflecting on what I said so people can link from my blog to all the other things I've been discussing. My discussion of, a, I did a magazine piece about the term Anglo-Saxon and its use in archaeology and how it may actually have a continued utility, despite what other people are saying, um, about how we envision cremation through our art to communicate past cremation practices. This links to work I did with the artist and archaeologist Dr. Aaron Watson. So I talk about my publications and the issues, as uh, one of my publications, so my blog is uh, has content that is about mortuary archaeology, mortuary archaeology's presence in the contemporary landscape, monuments, museums, artifacts, but also about how mortuary archaeology percolates into popular culture. Now, some of these things I have taken forward to publication. Other things I haven't taken forward to publication. They are there for the blog alone. I'm not trying to write them up. And the style I take in my blog is varied. I don't write massive long essays. I'm writing usually one to two, perhaps 3,000 words maximum with references occasionally, but not in a full academic rigorous style. So that I back up my points, but I don't take them forward to the rigor of what I would do in a full academic publication. So you can get your own flavour for that. And I would also say that you're also in a good position if you want to learn about blogging, because I've done two publications about it. So I did a 2014 paper with Katie Myers called Blog Bodies, Mortuary Archaeology and Blogging. That's from 2014, but you can find that with a Google search. It was published in the ebook by Doug, Doug Rocks McQueen and Chris Webster called Blogging Archaeology, published with Land 
landward research. So in 2014, I did a piece about archaeological blogging. And more recently, in an edited collection that I put together called Public Archaeology Arts of Engagement, in which Dr. Kenny Brophy also has a joint authored piece, I have a piece called Archaeodeath as Digital Public Mortuary Archaeology. So you can read about that in more detail of what I do in my blog on there. Some stats for you to finish off this first part. I um, have published about 1,500 blogs, as I said, about 200 per year. I have about 7,000 followers on WordPress itself. Um, I, ha I disseminate through Twitter, where I have just approaching 6,000 followers. Um, I have got a Facebook page, which disseminates the blog um, to 579 followers. And I've recently also expanded into YouTube, creating YouTube videos linked to my blog with the Archaeodeath label. I've currently got 231 subscribers to my YouTube channel and a TikTok following um, where I do short videos linked to my blog. I've got about 1,220 at the moment followers on TikTok. So my idea is it's a WordPress blog, but I disseminate through Twitter and Facebook and also through now video channels on TikTok and YouTube. So we've identified what my Archaeodeath blog is and it's links to through social media and to a TikTok and YouTube channel. And I've given you some stats, but I haven't really told you about why I do it. Why blog at all? Well, at one level, you could ask you, why don't you blog? Why wouldn't you blog? Now, I came to this about a decade after it was cool and trendy, and I thought it was a bit strange to pour everything you're doing onto a blog site and write up when I first encountered people doing it in the early noughties. But I, I am a convert and I do see its merit. There are, however, as you'll see through the publications I've alluded to, clear lines I do not cross with blogging. And things I don't do, but we'll come on to that in the do's and don'ts section at the end. What I do want to talk about is the whys of blogging. Well, part of my job description as an academic archaeologist is public outreach, and this is an important mechanism for doing that. Therefore, I consider blogging as integral to my research, my scholarship, and my teaching. Now, the, divide, the, the way I see that is I don't see this as, a, as a necessarily a replacement for face-to-face -face teaching. I don't demand or expect my students to view it in the same way as I don't presume or expect that people who want to know about my research look at my blog. But this is about reaching different kinds of audience, different diverse kinds of audience who would otherwise not learn about my work. Now, there are challenges to this and many people won't do this in academia because they are rightly frightened of abuse, threats and online comments about personal appearance, gender, age, ethnicity, accent, um, errors that inevitably happen when you say things and it goes wrong or you write things and it doesn't come out right. A lot of people are fearful and I think there's a lot of I have a lot of sympathy for that and I still get nervous about everything I put out on a blog and whether it will be received. But for me, whether it will be received well, but for me, I find it very useful because it's an integral way I can do public outreach. Now, ever since I started lecturing and being an academic at university, I've done public talks for local history societies, local archaeological societies. I've been giving lectures at other universities. I go to conferences and that is no one questions why you would bother doing that. Although there is now a question of whether there is a utility to some of those venues and places and some scholars attend more than others um, and not necessarily to their benefit. Um, but we can we're committed to doing our research, doing our scholarship and disseminating it and anything about not necessarily the content of our teaching, but our teaching practice, ideas, concepts that we, we try. The blog is a way of conveying that to a wider audience. Only perhaps 40 to 50 people will attend a public lecture I give in a local village hall. But in any single blog post, I can reach double that at least. And what I've also identified is that blog posts don't age. Everyone said to me, oh, it's like ephemeral, it's like news stories. Twitter, oh, no one remembers, no one, no one knows, no one cares, it all disappears quickly, it's like a news cycle. No, blogs stay. If you write a good blog post about something, it will be cited 
perhaps as long, if not longer, than an academic publication. So the things I write online are being read, are being recognised and increasingly are being cited as sources of information in themselves. I'm not always comfortable with that because my work isn't peer reviewed and it isn't necessarily as high quality if it's on a blog. Um, but there are things I've said on the blog that people are interested in, are good concepts and they are citing the blog or taking the information from the blog. And that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as it's complemented by other information. If you're a lazy student who are simply using my blog rather than going and looking at the right, the appropriate journals and books, then you're going to get a low mark from your lecturer. But if you use it for, as a source of opinion or perspective on an issue that you've also read extensively about in other media, then I think it has an important component. It's an important resource. So I use it for public outreach. I also use it for networking and exchanging, disseminating ideas within my academic community. And the academic community isn't simply people at university, students and scholars. It may be reenactors. It may be those that don't have access to the libraries and the resources or don't know where to go to get those resources. So it may be amateur groups, um, but it's people with a, within a network of special interests within my fields of research in early medieval archaeology, mortuary archaeology, memorialization and so on. So I, I pick up connections to other disciplines and other groups I wouldn't normally connect with in conferences or in publication venues. I also use it as a bit of a diary, to be honest with you, to record and keep a handle on all the things I get up to. And I also think it gives me the reason I do blogging as opposed to anything else, although I've started to do videos and Twitter is still there and I sometimes just post opinions on Twitter. But, you know, the reason I do blogging is it allows you a more considered, editable format. So if I say something and I get it wrong, I can retract, edit at, any mo at a moment's notice. If I find a typo, a couple of my blogs I've done late night and they've gone off and some pedant, pedant has said, there's a typo there. And you can go, oh, whatever, I can change that. Thanks very much. I don't say whatever, but I say, you yeah, know, thank you. I can change that. And if someone correct, suggests I've got something wrong, I can correct it. So I find why I blog is it's a medium that gives me full control. Now, some blogs are shared blogs of projects and research networks and people talk about a lot about the camaraderie and democracy of including multiple voices and that's all well and good for them but personally I find I like having the full control over what I write I can retract it if it's if it's uh, wrong or I need to edit it I can do so very very quickly and easily I also like blogging because it's a visual media I can pack in images that I wouldn't in a normal publication. So I've been able to tackle subjects that would otherwise be incomprehensible within a traditional academic publication I can blog about. So another reason I blog is that I can really experiment. I can use it as a medium for trying out new ideas and trying out new concepts, new approaches, saying things that are perhaps a little bit controversial or at least not fully substantiated to see what reception they get. Now, often you don't get feedback, but um, while there is a fear of plagiarism, the blog is a publication. The blog has a, a signature. So if someone steals my ideas from a pub academic publication or a blog, they can be traced back and dated and verified to my work. So they have to be cita cited. If I publish that idea and someone likes it, I said it first because it's on my blog. Thank you very much. So there's a lot of utility to blogging. I find it about public engagement, thinking in new ways, writing in new ways, proposing interim statements, interim ideas, and also, to be honest, a bit of a diary. Um, and all of this is because I think the topic of death matters. And I do it because death matters to people in the past and how we understand mortality in past societies. But death matters today and for our future of how we deal with death and the dead and the dying moving forward as a society. And so I write about it because my research area has a broad interdisciplinary significance within a range of different scholarly communities, I feel. Um, so that's another reason. So I've moved from the what of archaeo death to the whys of archaeo death, public engagement, um, experimentation, a diary, 
raising issues and having control and doing so quickly i should have also said i can i can you can blog relatively quickly and just get it out there without waiting through a process of peer review now it doesn't lack it lacks the rigor lacks the perhaps the the the, the scholarly integrity of publications and i wouldn't say that blogging is a is a sup, uh, is a replacement it's a supplement if anything to academic processes of publication but i think it has a place within that spectrum of media we deploy Next, some top tips. So I've got 10 points. I think six of them are do's and four of them are don'ts as top tips for archaeo death blogging or blogging about anything in archaeology. Um, first point is perhaps multi-sectioned and, and most important. Write how, when and about what you feel passionate about. You love your subject. You love your interests. Don't be tied to one theme. I call my, th my blog archaeo death. But some of the posts are about monuments, sites, landscapes, material cultures that are only partially about mortuary archaeology or archaeology as a memory. Don't be restricted. Don't be your own straight jacketer. Try and write about what and how and when you wish. And don't hold yourself to write only a... Um, you know what someone else tells you to do or to schedule that someone else does right when you're in the mood so some weeks i don't do any blogging some weeks i pack them in i've just written two blogs one yesterday one this morning uh, but then there was back on the 1st of august i've got three out in august and then there was mass uh, um, you look at the dates in which i publish that doesn't always mean that's the date i wrote them because i'm blogs take days or even weeks for me to get around to having the confidence or feeling i'm happy with them uh, but it does give you a sense of the fact that they come in spits and starts. And so you write when you want, how you want, um, about what you want, and then you have the passion to do it. Don't write, therefore, point two, don't write for a specific audience. Now, if you're trying to teach or you're trying to sell something, it's all about audiences. I think blogging is not about audiences. Blogging is about you. You write for yourself because... Some people you're aiming that at, of course, in the background, you've got a particular audience in mind, but some of those people won't be interested, won't see it, but other people will pick it up. And I've got a lot of people who follow my blog who are outside of archaeology, who may not read a lot of other things in archaeology. Others are avidly reading a range of other popular content, but they're not archaeologists. But my point is, you cannot design the audience. You've got to write for a broad audience without trying to pitch it at one group. You can go, hey, kids aged seven to nine, or hey, adults who are white middle class and living in Surrey. You know, you can't do that. You've got to write and be aware that the audience may be very different from what you expect. I have readers from around the world, and you've got to be aware that while I'm writing in English, um, uh, this may be going out to a wide audience. And that, that's a responsibility. Um, and it's not about disregarding the audience by saying don't write for an audience. I mean, don't write for an audience expecting only one group of people to be reading it. Be image rich. The, the, it, it, it's a textual medium. You're writing, but there's a potential of so many images to be included in. So here's one of my papers on the lock, one of my posts about the lockdown landscapes. And I've got a real rich range of images taken from my cycle rides and my walks when I couldn't move but a couple, a couple of kilometres from my house and only one um, one hour of exercise a day showing you the signs associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm going to pack a lot of images here. So this is almost an image gallery. Other posts are a mixture of text and image, but you can really use a lot of images. So point three is pack in those images rubbish bins appear quite a lot in my blog even though it's not really deathly um, you know you can really pack in the images and also I've used screen captures from TV shows uh, I haven't been told off for you doing this I can retract them if the TV company gets in touch there's there's Daryl from uh, the Walking Dead there in a museum uh, this is where they go into a museum in uh, in season nine uh, reflecting on American history how it's portrayed uh, and the walk of evolution there with a zombie pinned at the end of it. So in other words, I couldn't do that blog without doing some screen caps from a TV programme because you wouldn't be able to follow it. Now, you may watch the programme yourself, but this is a cue. I don't think this is, this may be in breach of copyright slightly, but it, I think it serves a function of promotes the programme and actually shows how the programme is operating and visualising mortuary material cultures. So I, I haven't had any problems or complaints about that yet. Edit. 
Now, some of the topics here are quite slapdash in my writings, and I don't agonising over every word. Other topics are quite heavy. So when I'm writing about the Gresford Mining Disaster Memorial, I need to get it right. I only write two short paragraphs, and it's a link to a YouTube channel. But I, 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 this needs to say something that's it, it, very, very precise about a very sombre monument to the deaths um, in 1934, of over 200, uh, 266 lives were lost. So it's a very sombre subject. So I need to not write stupid things or I need to edit very carefully. And sometimes I have edited out things where I've been a bit over the top. Other times I've left them in just to annoy people, particularly other archaeologists and academics. Um, sometimes I'm writing with a political voice. So I, this is a post I wrote about the coronavirus lockdown and the the link between England and Wales and the some of the rhetoric and the jokes online about uh, the differential lockdown easings between England and Wales, people referring to the ancient Linnea earthwork offers dyke in relation to that. So the editing is important. So point four is make sure you edit, don't just publish. And if you do publish, always you can always go back and edit things out, rearrange things. It's no shame in that. These aren't published. These are published, but they're not published um, in a fixed format, you can be versatile there. You can't rewrite what you said because that would be disingenuous. But if there's something you said that just, you know, you realise is being taken the wrong way or out of context, sometimes it's useful to go back and just re re-emphasise what you meant. If I do do a big change, I will put a note at the bottom of a blog. But editing is key. And another point is don't be afraid to write in instalments. The blog post is not a book. It's not even a single essay. You can write across multiple um, um, themes. So I'll give you one. One of the themes I've talked about is uh, um, reassembled arrangements of 19th century gravestones in chapels and churchyards. Here I've used a bit of colorization. They're not really that color. Um, and here, you know, uh, this is one of a series of posts. So I've actually got a post series on these mortuary lapidaria, these rearrangements of gravestones. But sometimes I'll write across multiple posts on the same subject. And you, it's not it's not repetition because I'm using different examples. Um, here's another. Here's a church with medieval stone fragments where I, uh, one of a series of posts I've done about these uh, the carved stone funerary monuments from Hope Church in Flintshire. Uh, and I've got links to earlier posts here so if you click on an earlier one it'll take you to um, some earlier bits of medieval grave slabs um, preserved in the fabric so writing installments is another top tip um, that's five and six back up your arguments where possible now this is another a good example where i have included one academic publication edwards 2013 a corpus of early medieval inscribed stones and stone sculpture from wales volume three because i am referring to a monument specifically published on and discussed by Professor Nancy Edwards. Other times I don't need to do that. Sometimes I just put the links to the Coughline or um, um, in, uh, Heritage Gateway sites or um, other online resources. Um, but try to back up your points where possible. You don't have to do full rigorous Harvard referencing style, but you can just back up to other key resources to make people aware of how to link from your blog to other resources. Even if you're disagreeing with them, people need to know what you're disagreeing with. So there are my six tips of things to do for. Uh, don't, don't make it a chore. Don't feel obliged to do it. Give it a break if it's getting to be bothersome. Or don't do it at all. It's, it should be fun and interesting and engaging. Don't feed the trolls is point number eight. Don't in engage with abusers. Try to trick you into saying things you didn't mean just so they can use you in their own online self-aggrandizement, which is a lot of what academics do. Um, there's various tactics used by self-proclaimed activists and voices to try and make you say things you didn't mean so that they can go, look at Howard Williams. He says this. No, I didn't. You know, there's lots of people who wanted to tell you what you said rather than what you actually said. So don't feed the trolls. Don't engage with that. Just clarify points of what you said, but don't get involved in their agendas. Um, don't be controversial just to be to gain attention is another point number nine. If you have to address a controversial issue because it's your responsibility, because it links to your area of research, do so and do so with integrity. But don't feel you have to address every ill news story, social um, commentary. There's been a terrible, terrible accident in the Lebanon recently. Um, I'm not immediately on my blog writing about some pithy 
woke comment about how Eastern Mediterranean medieval harbours were, were dangerous in their own way. You know, I, it's, 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 it's internally pompous and I see it being done by academics all the time. You don't have to be, speak about every issue. Talk about the things you have an interest in and you have a voice on, but don't necessarily feel you have to be a commentator on every political, social event, particularly every disaster. If Notre Dame uh, de Paris catches fire, you don't have to write a blog post about how it's pertinent to your research on land snails from um, Neolithic sites. For crying out loud, you have to have some integrity. And finally, don't expect consensus. You know, you're writing for an audience who will disagree with you, have different perspectives, different religious, political, economic, social, ethnic perspectives. Don't expect consensus. We can agree to disagree and we can do so politely. Uh, just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean they're trolling you. I was talking about a different point there, but you, you will get a, uh, expose yourself to very different opinions about your subject matter. And that is, on, is only good if it is constructive and it allows people to engage with the monuments and the sites and the landscapes of the debates and with a topic as controversial as death this is something that is going to happen all the time you know mortuary archaeology for some is is no no area you shouldn't be doing it shouldn't be visualizing gray should be visualizing these monuments it's ethically unsound for others it's an integral way in which we engage with past societies and their their experiences and their mortality so we've got to be aware that people have different views from us so there's my 10 do's and don'ts or 10 top tips uh, six do's and four don'ts for archaeo death so i hope you've enjoyed listening to these uh, this this video uh, which i've split into three sections what is archaeo death why do i do it and then some tips you're welcome to disagree with me i don't expect consensus but if you are thinking of going into blogging I would uh, recommend you read my two publications that I've uh, mentioned earlier and look at some of the other resources online by a range of scholars into the, the strengths of engaging with blogging, but also some of the limitations. And we can't all do everything, remember, and it's not a, a, another burden to put on us. It's supposed to be fun and interesting. And if it becomes uh, something that is just beyond your your comprehension just don't do it but i think it's a it's a under uh, under respected and under recognized and certainly under credited uh way of engaging communities in archaeological research and i intend to continue doing it for the foreseeable future thank you very much sadly we're all going to die but while you're waiting why not follow archaeo death subscribe now on youtube